So now we need hold downs, and now we need anchorage to the sill plate. Make sure the sill plate is anchored uh, for shear to the uh, concrete strip footing. So let's get those next. So if we hop back, and you know, I'm going to take a quick second here and just talk to everyone because this is something that I kind of didn't fully comprehend at one point, which is silly, but for some of you, it might be the same. So I want to express this outright, is that when you're talking about wood frame construction, it can seem the load paths in wood frame construction can be ridiculous. Like, obviously, there's so many studs, there's so much going on that like, it's it would be almost it can sometimes seem impossible to track your load paths down through the structure because there's so much redundancy and so many channels and pathways for that for those forces to go but to simplify it a little bit the so if we look here you have that's a stud just a typical stud and then that is your wood sheathing and you have a nail through there and we'll call that your eh, you know what we'll do this you have your double top plate. So that's the two pieces of wood along the top of your um, your stud wall. And then so this is your stud. That's your vertical stud at, you know, I don't know, 16 inches on center. Then you have your two but two times top plate. You have your edge nail. I'm gonna do this right on the fly. You have your what do we call three eighths inch ply. And that stud is again, two by six, two by six. Okay. So what's the components that make up a wall in wood in stud wood framing is the studs. So uh, let's see how I want to do this better. I'm gonna draw it. Sorry, sorry. Stick with me. <laughs> so in blue here. So your studs, that's all purely for gravity. That is to resist forces due to gravity. So, gra or gravity forces. So you have self-weight of structure, you have snow loads, you have uh, live loads. Um, so all that type of stuff, that is purely gravity elements. And then you have your, she your sheathing, which is part of your lateral elements. So sheathing takes all of the forces, uh, all the lateral forces, that, that's it. So you need to make sure when you're looking at load paths that when you're looking at lateral forces, the load path needs to be able to get into that sheathing, down through the sheathing, and then into the sill plate, and then into the foundation. That That is the path. There's no traveling of, you know, so here, here's a, here's a really great example of it. So here's your... Here's your diaphragm, okay? Let's, again, let's mix it up a little. There's your, there's your diaphragm in green. And that diaphragm is, is your flat, what I call your flat lateral element. And that's taking your forces, uh, your lateral forces, and that's distributing them to your shear walls. So now you have forces at your shear wall, which we will denote with a green, big green circle here. And that's a line load going along your shear wall like we talked about above here. So that's going all along the top here. So that green dot is that all the way along your shear wall. And that means, well, how do we get that force into our shear wall? Because you could just look at it and say, well, if there's, because typically you'll have it nailed, your diaphragm is going to be nailed to your double top plate. And you're like, okay, well, it's nailed to the top plate. So, I mean, it's good. I guess maybe the forces get in, it, the forces are in the shear wall, so I'm good. But what you really need to comprehend is you need to make sure the load path is there laterally and for gravity. So for lateral, those forces are going to travel through your shear wall or through your diaphragm. They're going to go into your nailing. They're going to be now in your double top plate. Then they're going to move into your edge nailing and then in to your uh, wood sheathing. And they're going to take that wood sheathing all the way down and then actually what happens at the bottom, and this is where we're getting to next with our anchorage check. And you know what? It's not a, it's just a single sill plate at the bottom. And then we'll just say that that's our concrete footing. Everybody, hopefully everyone, 
I haven't lost everyone yet, but this is super, super important. So it gets all the way down, and then here's your stud. And it gets all the way down your sheathing, and then there's edge nailing down uh, for your sheathing at the bottom into your sill plate. And so now those lateral forces are moving all the way through your sheathing, and now they're going back into your sill plate. So now you got them from the fruit, from the green diaphragm above all the way down into your concrete stem wall down here. But they're at the sill plate now. And now how do we get them through there? Well, what we need to do, or what we do do is, hey, do do. What we do do is fasten that sill plate with uh, anchor bolts and that are usually cast in place or drill and epoxy sometimes, but cast in place is usually how we like it. And those anchor bolts, they take the rest of those lateral forces and through shear, through the anchor bolts down into your concrete stem wall. And then from there, we made it to the foundation, we made it to the, the soil below, and we are, we are all done. So that's in essence how your load path works for lateral forces through your shear wall. It's not just like, oh, I got it to the shear wall, it's all done, like magic. Um, especially if you, you have it like fastened to your stud wall and you're like, oh, well, if it's in the studs, then it's done. You know, that's not the case. And that's honestly, I was naive and that's exactly what I thought when I was just starting out. I'm like, oh, it made it to my shear wall. So I'm all done. It's like, no, you need to prove through your load pass how it gets all the way down into the foundation. That's the big one. So Super big side tangent, but I hope you stuck in there because that bit of info is really going to freaking jack you up, move you up the ranks, and improve your engineering. So hopefully I explained it well enough. I, I really hope I did. Reach out, make a comment below if I did not, and you want me to go specifically a video with just, just this, this diagram that I just drew here, okay? So let's move on to our anchor bolt design. Step two is our, whoop, our anchor bolts. So, today I'm only going to be checking bolt capacity, so the shear capacity of our anchor bolts, and figuring out spacing, uh, required spacing, or, or maximum spacing of the anchor bolts in order to properly transfer shear forces um, from our shear wall to our uh, concrete stem wall. But almost always, you're all, well, always you're going to do another check, which is checking the um, anchorage of the anchor bolt into the concrete itself, and that you'd need to run some additional checks, and that's where we would get into using like um, a Hilti Profis uh, anchor design software or a Simpson anchorage design software. Um, DeWalt, I believe, has another anchorage design software. So based on the product that you choose, the anchor bolt type that you choose, um, you need to check that that criteria as well. I'm not going to get into that today. That's going to be a whole separate video. It's pretty straightforward, but the calculations, to do calculations by hand for anchorage into concrete is can be tedious and long, so that's a whole, it's, it's a whole, other, it's a whole other story. So today we're just going to be checking bolt capacity, so don't, don't at me with that, uh, with, well, you didn't check the, uh, you know, the anchorage into the concrete and blowout and stuff like that and all that kind of stuff. Come on, giving you, the, giving you the heads up right now that always you need to check that, but we're not today. So, okay, here we go. We have, for those don't know, I'm going to blow it up for us. So here's our blown up stem wall, which is too shallow. Let's do that again. Here's our stem wall. And we have our sill plate. So our 2 by 6 sill plate, since we're calling out a 2 by 6 wood construction here. And... What's going to happen is we have anchor bolts that fasten that are usually cast in place, but they could be epoxy anchor, which means uh, drill and epoxy. So they would cast the stem wall first, and then they would come back and they would choose where they need to install their anchors, and they would drill the holes into the concrete, pull it out, um, goop up, the inside of the hole with a very, very strong epoxy resin, and then they would cast their, or not cast, but they would then insert their threaded rod. It wouldn't be an anchor bolt with a nut encased in concrete. It'd be a threaded rod that goes down into the epoxy, and then that would that epoxy would cure, and then that would be your 
um, your anchor bolt. So there's that method. There's also mechanical fasteners, which is you, dr you cast your footing first again, you drill your hole again, but instead of an epoxy resin, they actually have what's called like a wedge anchor or a mechanical fastener, which is a threaded rod anchor type of, um, type of fastener. And it's usually there, there's multiple ways that this works. So there's different types of products, but there's usually two wings on the, let's see, let me try to draw it on the anchor bolt for a mechanical fastener. And they slide that in and there's wings here on the edges at the bottom. And once they install it, and that's your hole, what they do is they then take a torque wrench and they torque um, the the fastener into the into the drilled hole and what that does is that flares out the wings and wedges it against the edges of the hole the drilled hole that it was inserted into and now it's wedged in place so now if you want to try and pull up on it you can't uh, th there's now capacity there so there's that type of method, but then there's just good old fashioned what we like to do if it's new construction is cast in place. So they, the contractor will set the anchor bolts with a, usually they can do for lighter construction, you could do like a J bolt. J bolts suck in my opinion. Um, they, don't, they cost just as much as a, a hex, a hex bolt, um, which is really just a bolt like this. And then there's a nice hex nut at the bottom of it that has a lot more capacity and they're the same price, but contractors for really small stuff, especially residential, they love to use J-bolts, but J-bolts you'll find don't have nearly as much capacity. So don't let them try to play games with you, but sorry, I'm getting off track. And they will set those in place in the formwork for the concrete before the concrete's poured, then they'll once all the anchor bolts are set in the proper positions, then they'll come and they'll cast the concrete stem wall and the anchor bolts will be cured in place. So they'll be cast in place. So that's the option we're going with today. I don't know if you needed to know all that, but you know, the more, the more you know. Okay. So what, what do we need to know? What do we need to know here? I'm telling you so much stuff and you're like, well, let's get down to what's the calculations. Calculations are, you still have shear from above, which we said was V required, which is 158 PLF. Well, that still needs to be transferred through the shear bolts. So, or through the <laughs> anchor bolts through shear. And let's assume a 3 8 inch diameter, A307 anchor bolts. Uh, it's starting to sound a lot like steel construction or steel design. Well, you are right, my friend. We are getting into the AISC steel manual. So uh, we're going to be jumping into the 15th edition because I have the PDF version. So if you got the 14th, which is the maroon, you can still follow along. And actually, a funny thing for bolt capacities, both tensile and shear, the values are slightly different from the 14th to the 15th edition. So... That's a little something for you. Maybe I got that brewing in another video, but I, you know, I don't know. So don't be afraid if I start to show a capacity here that you're like, where the frick did he get that from? It's because they've changed slightly from the 14th edition to the 15th edition. So we need to go to bolt shear strength, which is table 7-22. So let's hop over there now. Sorry, I lied to everyone. Table 7-1, not table 7-22. So... Here we are, table 7-1, and this is available shear strength of bolts. Pretty straightforward. We've nominated A307 as our bolt criteria, and um, we can just go over. So we are still in ASD, so phi VN over omega in KSI. So that's ASD. It's 13.5 KSI. And now you just take that value, and you multiply by your nominal bolt area, which is this line here, and that gets you your capacities. Um, and then you have obviously single loading or double loading of your bolt. We have single loading. So that gets you that value in essence. So 0 0.307 times 13.5, that gets you 4.14, let's see. That's where they derive those values from. So, um, But you might be saying to yourself, wait a minute, I don't have a nominal bolt diameter um, 
or we're choosing a 3 8 inch diameter bolt, the least they go down to is a 5 8 bolt. So what do we do now? Well, don't panic. Let me get this stuff out of the way. Now hop over to 7-17, which is on 7-83. And this is one of my favorites here because this gives you all of your areas for the type of bolts of all different sizes, even if they're not or tabulated in the tables that we were just previously at. But, so we need to use a combination of this table information and the previous table information. So we need a 3 8 inch bolt right there. And we need the gross bolt area to multiply that by the capacity given in the previous table. So gross bolt area of 3 8 inch is 0 0.110 inches squared. And you might say, well, I can just do 3 8 inch, you know, pi r squared. Like, why can't I just do that? Well, it's slightly different. The bolts aren't specifically that diameter, and you have the threads as well. So you need to be careful. You need to take a look at what they actually specified, a 3 8 inch bolt or any bolt diameter, what the actual dimensions are. For this, we have 0.11 inches squared. And now let's head back to our shear capacities in the previous table on 7-1. And we can say we have 13.5 KSI for ASD. So we have everything we need. So let's hop back to get our available shear strength for our anchor bolts. So we have VN equals 0.11. 1, 1 inches squared, that's the area of our shear bolt, times, shit, I already forgot, 13.5 KSI. That's going to equal, and those value, the 13.5 KSI, that already takes into account fee and everything like that, so you don't have to worry about any more factors. So that's, that's it. So 0 0.11 times 13.5 is 1.485 kips per bolt for V allowable, you can call it V allow, or you can call it V, uh, V N, V sub N over omega. I mean, they're the same thing for ASD. And now what you can do is you can say, well, we have 20 foot shear wall. I'm going to draw a really crude shear wall again, 20 feet long, right? And we want to say, well, how many anchor bolts do we need? And what is that maximum spacing that it can be? So we can just do 100, and let's break it into kips. So 0.158 KLF, that's your V required, times 20 feet. So we're going to break it down to that point load that we solved for at the very beginning. And that is 3.16 kips. And now you can divide that by V allowable, which is 1.485 kip per bolt, and that will give you number of bolts. So the number of bolts minimum required to transfer the shear forces is what? 2.127 bolts. So that we need to round up because you can't have a fraction of a bolt, right? So three bolts is going to be how many anchor bolts we need. So we need three 3 8 inch diameter A307 uh, anchor bolts cast in place. So that's what we'd call out, and that means that, and that's, so say, say for instance that we only needed two anchor bolts. If we only needed two, the minimum that we normally specify is three per shear wall, um, or not even shear wall, but sill, sill plates, anywhere that uh, anchor bolts would be required. Um, we do three minimum just to stop kind of rotation. So you want one at each end and then kind of one centered in the middle if if three were the minimum required. So you don't just want one at each end. You want to fasten a middle one as well because you can start to get deflection criteria, um, starting to drive some stuff if you, uh, if you had a, a decently long span. Um, or what you can also call out that's typical is like a maximum spacing. So even if, again, you only needed... Uh, three anchor bolts, but it was a 60 foot long wall. Well, maybe you would say, uh, you know, space anchor bolts to 15 feet max. And that means that they would actually need to put four anchor bolts for that 60 foot long wall. It, it's, there's certain criteria that you don't want to get too, too far just based on the strength of your, um, the sheer strength of your, of your anchor bolt. So keep that in mind. Certain, uh, certain requirements you might want to think about there, but that's more in the professional world. So, to think those things through. 
Um, okay, but there we are. So that's our anchor volts. And again, we did not check anchorage and the capacity of the anchor in concrete. So that's a whole nother check for another day. This is just the bolt strength itself. So, you know, and a funny thing that I just forgot, and it's going to... It's going to mess you guys up a little bit, but this is what truly happens. When you're designing for seismic criteria, um, remember when I talked about omega or the overstrength factor, like way at the beginning, and I was like, when we were talking about load cases, and I said, ah, don't, don't worry about that. Well, when you worry about omega and the, what's called the overstrength factor, it's the same thing. It's, it's an omega factor. Um, that is for seismic design and lateral design for connection criteria and specifically it can be for or it is for connection of to concrete and embedment into concrete elements under seismic loading so for your anchor bolt design you're anchoring into concrete so that means you do actually need to apply an omega factor and omega is based on a couple of different things i do want to say that you would need to want to apply an omega factor for for your anchor bolt design. So I do apologize um, for shear walls, for wood stud construction with with, shear, uh, with plywood shear panels or structural paneling. I think it's uh, omega equals 2.0. And what that breaks down to is you need to multiply your required shear by omega. So, or half, or divide by, divide the capacity of your anchors by omega. So, and again, that's not this omega, that's for ASD. And now it's confusing, right? You're like, omega, omega, great, freaking kill me. But sorry about that. Um, but So what you would check is actually, so let's divide the allowable shear per anchor bolt that we found. So VVN, and to not totally freak you guys out, let's do this. V allow equals 1.485 kip per bolt. Now you need to divide that by your overstrength factor of 2. So that's going to get you 0 0.7, eh, call it 0 0.75 kit per bolt. That is what you would need to use just, just for your connection um, to concrete under seismic criteria. And that would mean that you would need more anchor bolts. Let's say that basically since you divided by 2, that it doubles the amount of anchor bolts. So, well, you know, let's just finish it up. Uh, 3.16 kips divided by 0 0.75 kip per bolt. That's going to equal 4.21. So that rounded up is 5 bolts. So you would need 5 anchor bolts for this shear wall. So again, I know you're probably, you know, kind of off the rails right now. Like, what the heck is that that he just introduced? Where did he get it from? Is he talking about something in the code? Is this just for seismic? Is it for other things? It's it is just for seismic criteria, so I do apologize. Um, I will go over this more in depth in another video, but but not today. So don't worry about that too much if you don't want to right now. But that's it. That's that's the design of your anchor bolts. And again, sorry about that. Uh, next and lastly, we need to design hold down. So, all right, Team Cast of a part two done for wood shear wall design. Hope you're hanging in there. I know it's a longer video. A lot of info in there. I hope you're just eating it up and you're really liking it. Uh, and stay tuned for that cliffhanger for part three. I know a lot of you have asked questions about how to design hold downs. That's been your number one question. So I'm going to tease you a little longer, and that's going to be in next week's part three final video. Um, but until then, if you liked this video, give it a like. Um, subscribe if you haven't already. You know, Join this team right now. There's nothing stopping you. And if you want all those sick notifications about more stuff that we're learning, you know, hit that little ding-a-ling bell and uh, get notified. But until then, let's keep pushing towards our goal of that 1,000 subscriber mark. So we hit 500 subscribers just last week, and now we're approaching 600. So super cool. Uh, so happy Halloween to everyone out there watching. It's Halloween today, October 31st. So... Nothing too spooky about this video, except for how awesome it was. Um, but I'll see you guys in the next one. This is Rich with Kestova. Later.